From the book Conversations with Pauline Kael, edited by Will Brantley. Pauline Kael on the New Hollywood by Pet Alfterheide, 1980. Introductory Remarks Pauline Kael is the premier movie critic in the U.S. Since she began writing about films as a broadcast and print critic, and also film programmer, in 1953, and especially since she became a New Yorker critic in 1968, she has consistently challenged, fascinated, and enraged readers with her incisive and provocative opinions on movies. Film criticism is an art form that has perilously few serious regular practitioners, and most of them are dismally narrow in focus. Kale avoids two standard pitfalls, a high cultural pedantry that tries to raise the subject to the technique, or a cheery populism that ignores the hard questions. Further, she sees American film as unique, not only because it is accessible to, and seductive of, mass audiences, but because Hollywood grew up in and produces for a democratic society. In an earlier anthology, Kale wrote, quote, The words Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which I saw on an Italian movie poster, are perhaps the briefest statement imaginable of the basic appeal of movies. This appeal is what attracts us, and ultimately what makes us despair when we begin to understand how seldom movies are more than this. End quote. In another anthology, Deeper into Movies, she wrote, quote, I try to use my initial responses, which I think are probably my deepest and most honest ones, to expose not only what a movie means to me, but what it may mean to others, to get at the many ways in which movies, by affecting us on sensual and primitive levels, are a supremely pleasurable and dangerous art form. End quote. That double edge of movie art is never far from her reading of particular films. Her most recent collection of reviews, When the Lights Go Down, provides the same wealth of information and a chronological overview of film for the period 1975 to 1980 that her former anthologies have. It is rich in small, punchy pleasures. Take her review of The Deer Hunter, which she called an astonishing piece of work, an uneasy mixture of violent pulp and grandiosity, with an enraptured view of common life. Its male characters, with their Boy Scout Americanism, she found American cousins of hobbits. She described the Vietnam helicopters as Walpurgish not locusts coming down on your head. Noting the film's attitude toward women, she called the bridesmaids plump, stuffed with giggles, and she noted her De Niro's sea-to-shining-sea sea muscularity. The collection also contains the other traditional attraction of her anthologies, a longer essay. This time it's a profile on Cary Grant's career, which functions as much as a historical essay on film styles and on changing images of the masculine as it does a personal assessment. But it doesn't have the bite of an essay like Trash Art and the Movies. For that, we can look to the much-debated Fear of Movies essay, also anthologized here, which accused New Yorker readers of hiding fears of social and racial tension behind a sanctimonious indictment of violent films. Kale has long defended the passion and energy of American filmmaking against those who would censor or dismiss it. But now, of the two paths of commercial film, one toward safe banality, the other toward a technician's approach to emotional manipulation, neither is likely to generate the kind of greatness in movie-making that she was able to find in, say, Bonnie and Clyde. Then, against a tide of protest against the film's violence, she argued, quote, Our best movies have always made entertainment out of the anti-heroism of American life. End quote. Yes, she wrote, the film was violent and audiences, quote, should feel uncomfortable, but this isn't an argument against the movie, end quote. 
Her defense of filmmakers' right to make audiences uncomfortable goes on, but the films often don't bother to claim the right. This was the year in which Kale, long the only critic who garnered the respect of the Hollywood filmmaking community on a weekly basis, finally left film criticism for filmmaking, if only temporarily. Taking a five-month leave of absence from The New Yorker, she became an executive consultant with Warren Beatty under a Paramount contract. Now that period is at an end, and Kale is at a point of decision. Question. Will you return to writing film criticism? Kale. I'm torn because the movies are very bad now, especially in the last couple of years, and writing regularly about movies is very painful if the movies themselves are not stimulating, particularly if you've been writing for as many years as I have. Reeling, the book just before this one, covered a wonderful period in the movies, the mid-70s, and the first part of When the Lights Go Down covers a wonderful period, but they get less interesting as the book goes on. I think a lot of what's happened is simply that the movie companies have been able to take the risk factor out of financing movies by selling them in advance to TV, international TV, cable, home box office, as well as selling them in advance to theaters. They will not take a risk on projects that are not desirable for TV. They want to get all their money guaranteed in advance. They can do that using TV stars like John Ritter or Henry Winkler, They can use big-name stars, and they can set up projects with readily paraphrasable themes that are easy to sell to TV. About the only studio-made picture that took a risk recently, and it was a very small one, was Breaking Away, because it had no stars and no obvious theme. And it happens to be one of the few good movies of the year. I thought the best American movie of the year was The Black Stallion. Without Francis Ford Coppola arranging financing for that, it would never have been made. Of course, he knew Ballard, they were at UCLA together, but it took courage to give more and more money to get things right, because it took much longer than they anticipated. A regular studio would probably have cancelled production. I also liked The Warriors, and if the studio had realized the problems they were going to have with it, it would never have been made. I thought Richard Pryor live in concert had the greatest performance of the year. Richard Pryor gave a performance millions of miles ahead of the performances nominated for the Academy Awards. And Bette Midler gave the performance that stood out among actresses. The Rose was not a great picture, but she was doing things that had never been done before, something original. But the studios are very happy with utter conventionality because then they don't have to worry about making another soundtrack for TV, or dirty words, or violence, or sex. They are terrified of anything that will not readily satisfy the networks. The only time it's fun to write about bad movies is when they're being universally praised, and you know they'll make a lot of money, and you want to tell people why you think they're being suckered. Or if a picture has a huge campaign and people are taking it as a work of art, and you think it's not very good. Question. Are conventional movies being made to suit the era, or does the economics of the industry define the conventionality? Kale. I think it ties in together. The younger generation has grown up under the rating system, and they have only seen G and PG films, so almost anything that has a little bit of shock value can knock them out. Previous generations could go to any movie. But since the rating system was set up, the kids see mostly dull pictures. So if they see something a little crazy, they get very excited about it. Animal House has a kind of crazy, silly energy. A gross-out is fun. It's amusing. I understand why kids go to the Dawn of the Dead. If you've been taught respect for propriety and blandness, and suddenly you see all these heads being splattered, and it's obviously artificial, you get the giggles. Older people often take violence in movies awfully seriously, when the audience doesn't necessarily take it that seriously. Obviously, the violence of Mean Streets is very different from the violence of Dawn of the Dead. Mean Streets and Taxi Driver are both wonderful movies that upset people on a different level, 
it upsets you the way art often does. I don't see how you can have art that investigates certain areas of experience without upsetting people. I mean, Macbeth is very upsetting. King Lear is almost intolerable if it's well done well. Question. When you wrote in The New Yorker that people are afraid to go to American movies now, there was a tremendous backlash. Kale. Yes, the readers of The New Yorker have been putting down American films for years and going to very bland foreign films. I loved pointing out that it used to be exactly the reverse. They would go to foreign films for sex because there wasn't any in American films. Now they go to foreign films because there's nothing there but genteel, polite sex, whereas American films are free enough to deal with social and economic tension, and they don't like being upset by those tensions. To raise the issue that Michael Wood did in the New York Times book review of whether my approach to movies is populist chic, although he decided it wasn't, sort of misses the point. It's precisely the readers of The New Yorker I'm addressing with that argument. You wouldn't make that argument to blacks in a Broadway theater. It's exactly those educated people who are self-protective and who are going to foreign films instead of seeing the day-to-day -day reality of some American films who don't want to be upset. They feel they've been through a lot during the war years. There's been all this violence, and they're afraid of the tensions in the city. They want to keep the race issue down. When they go to the theater, they want everything to be nice and sweet. But art that does not deal with the tensions in a society is not art. It's just a repressive, cheerful kind of German kitsch. The Germans are the most sentimental people in the world in their movies. If you look at their movies of the 30s and 40s, you want to choke. They turned out pastry shop musicals. The greatness of American films has always been the freedom to get at what was going on in the society. But educated people have more and more pulled back. In part, I think this is a reaction to the fact that the self-hatred did become intolerable in American movies for a while. The culmination is Apocalypse Now, which is an orgy of self-hatred. It doesn't look at the facts of the war, of what we were doing there. Instead, we are carriers of metaphysical evil. We are demons. And that was the attitude in a lot of American films during the war years, even westerns that deal with an early period of American life. The Americans are racists who shoot up the Indians for the careless joy of it, in Little Big Man, for instance. It was a sophisticated criticism. The Indians, for instance, would have Vietnamese faces. The key girl we saw killed in slow motion in Little Big Man was definitely an Oriental. The directors were making points, and it got to a point where people felt oppressed when they got up from the theater. They felt guilt-ridden, but they didn't know what to do about it because the movies never examined facts, they just thrust guilt in their laps. But now it seems movies and TV want to swing totally back to an earlier period and not absorb the skepticism, say, that you felt in the Godfather movies. The Godfather is the fullest examination of the American experience in American movies. In cop movies and in a lot of uh, men's adventure and action films, Directors thrust violent confrontations at you, and almost any American you saw at any period was a son of a bitch. They were very self-righteous, showing Americans what America really was, that sort of thing. It was a tendency in the culture, not for any particular group of filmmakers. Chickness was to attack the squares. You look at a movie like Coming Home. It isn't enough that the husband is a hawk, but because he is, he must not satisfy his wife in bed, that kind of naivete. And all the wives of hawks are women who don't want to work in military hospitals. Actually, we know that a lot of these women worked very hard to take care of those men. So it's that kind of simplification. If you are a right-winger in any sense, you are a total nothing. If you're on the left, you're right in everything. Question. Is it left, or is it liberal, or moralistic? Kale. Mostly liberal, but in some cases it's left. Because there's nothing directly political, you may not see that they're really left-wing, that movies in those years did represent the lib-lab point of view. I would say the first big movie to swing the other way is The Deer Hunter. That and the Clint Eastwood movies do represent a right-wing consciousness. 
It's not explicitly political, they're just right-wingers. But most of the movies were the other way, definitely. Certainly there were a lot of moralistic films, but it's more than that. If you saw Midnight Cowboy, the society was shown as corrupt, desperate, callous. America would have been shown as different in an earlier period. That kind of thing happened during the Vietnam period. Every city film that had it covered the screen, and older people resented it. Movies seemed to them to be too free in language. They didn't like the way America was represented. They didn't like the new actors. They always say there are no stars anymore, because they couldn't accept Al Pacino and Dustin Hoffman as stars. They wanted those perfect, good-looking guys with an English accent and wasp profiles. They had Robert Redford, but he was the only one, and he was doing Lib Lab movies where he was the perfect gentleman. Very ugly things go into those movies in order to protect the beautiful wasp image. Think of All the President's Men, of the ethnic prejudice of that movie. Robert Redford was always the one saying to the witness that they were trying to get to talk, You don't have to talk to us if you don't want to. And the Jewish one was always pushing and tricking them. And the way that journalism was represented was preposterous. The assumption that those two did it single-handedly, when obviously their great success depended on having an informer. Question. Did your work in Hollywood change your impression of how movies are made? Kale. I got a more specific understanding. In a lot of movies I had seen that fell apart, I had thought there never was a decent script. In many cases I discovered there was a remarkable script. It was that the direction wandered off from them. I began to see more and more that the real need is for better producers, and I began to see why Warren Beatty and Paramount were interested in having me come out to Los Angeles. There seem to be almost no producers who watch every detail of a picture. I know I couldn't do it. It's past the point in my life when I could take on that kind of responsibility. It takes a patience and a toughness I don't think I have. But the industry needs the kind of producer Warren Beatty was on Bonnie and Clyde and Shampoo, and I regret to say that when he's directing, he does not have that kind of producer. Most of the people who take the title of producer on movies are the executive producer, which means they help set up a real creative tension with the director to keep them from missing the point, to keep from losing track of the structure. In picture after picture, I think, why wasn't there somebody there? For instance, Coal Miner's Daughter has a wonderful opening, and then none of the themes are sustained or carried through. Or Bound for Glory. There was a good script, and the director wandered off from it for about 45 minutes, and the end of the picture went down the drain. Or Being There, which for the most part follows the script. Suddenly at the end, Peter Sellers is wandering in the water. Well, in Coming Home, also directed by Hal Ashby, Bruce Stern wandered off into the water. It's a preposterous director's conceit. The only reason anyone can think of is that Hal Ashby lives in Malibu. New York, New York had a wonderful script, and then it got rewritten and improvised on, and the whole point got lost. Directors often don't have the structural or literary sensibility that went into the creation of those characters in the first place. You can't put the writer in charge because he's so literal-minded that he insists that the director stick with his script, even when the director has made the point without using all his dialogue. It is the producer's function not to coerce the director, but simply to be there and create a tension so that if things are going wrong, someone is there who can point it out, and to do that requires a lot of patience and diplomacy. The reason that there aren't more good producers is because the deal has become so important. They're getting their money anyway, they're getting it pre-sold, so nobody worries about artistic unity. The executives of the studios don't care very much. Most of them are quite honest about the fact that they aren't terribly interested in movies. They used to care. They often had appalling taste, vulgar, corny, bland, cheerful, phony, but they took great pride in pictures. Nowadays, you wouldn't get the job by talking about movies, but by providing reassurance to your superiors and never indicating to them that you might know more about movies or care about them more than they do. We can't tell yet what the younger producers might do. Coppola is still releasing through the commercial structure. Lucas has very commercial taste. 
neither has as much freedom as they might on their own. Question. Coppola didn't do a good job of producing Apocalypse Now. Kale. But you can't produce and direct at the same time. I think if he had had a producer with independent power, they would never have started production until the script was finished. And then I don't think the picture would ever have gone into production, because there is no way to transfer Heart of Darkness to a movie today. It's the story of a white man who goes native, and the horror is his reversion to barbarism. But of course we no longer think of blackness and going native in the same terms. We think of those people as having their own culture. We don't think of being in the jungle with no clothes on, in the same way English readers of that period thought of it. None of the mechanics of the movie make sense. You could not have the Martin Sheen character go upriver to him on a little boat while planes are carrying messages and supplies to him. The showcase sequence of the helicopters comes early. How can you go further than the craziness that the Robert Duvall character plays? The film has no structure. There's no possible confrontation between Sheen and Brando because Sheen is already a cold-blooded killer who murders an injured girl. So what has he got to change into? When it turns out that the injured girl only moved to protect a puppy, you want to say, Oh, Francis, the, the old puppy number. I think people who love it are taking it as a head trip. They're going to get stoned on the sensual imagery. The movie's feeling for bombs bursting is like what Mussolini's son-in-law talked about, and how he loved the bombs bursting over Ethiopia. I think people who loved this one loved the carnage, too. It sure doesn't make you hate war. Question. Do you believe that newspaper and magazine film critics play an important role? Kale. Yes, although it depends on the critic. In general, I think people are hostile to critics because they hear the stars and directors on TV jumping on them. But it's so silly, because without criticism, you're completely at the mercy of advertisers. The influence of the critic is so small compared with the power of the advertiser. There are critics who make a lot of difference to their communities. Gary Arnold of the Washington Post, for instance, has enough followers to take an obscure film and get people excited about it. Not that journalism is in good shape in this country. News writing is awful. Everyone imitates the New York Times, and when it adopted all those sections, which was a kind of imitation of People magazine, everyone else did. Now there's less space for other kinds of news and for criticism of the arts, and instead they want personality coverage. The proliferation of gossip and unchecked rumors in journalism is startling. A lot of things are going wrong, and some of it is the result, I think, of Woodward and Bernstein. People are on the tail, personally, of people in office, but they don't investigate issues. They worry about whether a president stumbles or uses the wrong word, or they jeer at his family. That really began to grow with Lyndon Johnson because of the Vietnam War. It became a form of protest to jeer at the president, and now it has a kind of validity. I don't think the national magazine critics are doing the job they could, mostly because most of them don't stay in it for very long. They don't get involved in their art form enough to take the space to write. They have it if they want it. It's been years since anyone has complained that my New Yorker articles are too long. The only chance for new work, innovative work, work that's disturbing in any way, to reach the public is if a few critics get behind it. Movie studios would be perfectly happy making the same kind of big, star-ridden, boring movies year after year. There would be no chance of new life in the industry. That's the abrupt end of that article. And I thank you for listening.